thank you so much uh, uh, to the audience for for their sincere patience. Uh, you uh, you have waited on us till the very last session, so it really means a lot to us. Uh, and can we have a, a quick round of uh, clapping for yourself only if, if we were to put it. So uh, not only is your patience extraordinary, but so is the patience of our panelists. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would like to, you know, quickly introduce uh, uh, to the audience uh, our uh, eminent panelists here. Uh, to start with, uh, we have uh, Mr. Devashish Nandi, who is the CFO at a travel agency company, uh, Thomas Cook, a very well-renowned company, uh, having operations in as many as 29 countries. And uh, if I were to add one uh, personal fact about the CFO uh, is that he says that he loves uh, photography more than what he does, uh, you know, love finance. So his inclination towards finance is much more than, uh, his inclination towards photography is much more than even finance. Second, uh, we have uh, fortunately the lady CFO, uh, uh, that gives itself a, a different flavor to the entire discussion. Uh, her name is uh, Nidhi, uh, uh, Nidhi Batavia. She is CFO at Sanathan Textiles. Uh, it's, 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 it's a great company in, in, uh, and a manufacturer of yarns. Uh, one personal fact about her is that uh, uh, she is a lover of table tennis. So, Good evening, friends. Uh, next we have uh, the last but not the least, actually who has uh, reached uh, to the state level uh, table tennis uh, and you would wonder what is he doing as a finance professional. So we have uh, none other than uh, Mr. Ritesh uh, Bansali who is CFO at Yokohama India. Yokohama India is uh, the Indian subsidiary of the Japanese uh, parent and is a tire company. Thank you Manu for the lovely introduction and good evening everyone. Okay. Uh, so before we uh, uh, start the conversation, can we have a quick round of applause for the panelists, if you don't mind. So to begin this uh, conversa conversation, so to say, let me uh, begin uh, with you, uh, Mr. Devashit Nandi. Uh, there's a lot being already said uh, in, in the conversations that we had about technologies, uh, digitization. Uh, but if I could start with as lemon a question is this that uh, does a CFO or do CFOs understand smart technologies today in totality? Actually, you know, uh, um, it is not about the CFO. Does the CFO understand uh, smart technology? Uh, a CFO cannot do without smart technology. That's a, the, that's the position today, that uh, a CFO cannot afford to be uh, a non-technical guy. He cannot say that I live in the world of finance and technology is not for me. So technology is as integrated to finance as in any other function. Okay, uh, that's a quick answer. But before I jump to uh, uh, to Nidhi uh, for the answer, uh, uh, I quickly wanted to inform audience. I think uh, there is some uh, uh, medical emergency uh, for which uh, another lady CFO could not make us uh, could not make it to the event. Her name is Nitu Kashi Ramka, uh, CFO VIP Industries. There had been some medical emergency, so she had to pull out. Uh, but we certainly uh, miss her. Uh, and I just wanted to inform that. So Nidhi, uh, coming to you in respect of what is your understanding of the smart technologies uh, and uh, do you think that CFOs really understand uh, that term in totality? I think in today's world, CFOs cannot survive or live without smart technologies. So uh, any CFO, uh, for that matter, to run uh, the operations as well as oversee the functions, be it treasury, be it accounting, be it fp and um, and so on, the smart technology is very much required. Uh, so, you know, you start as if you're starting day one of a new organization, right from creating a master to uh, generating a purchase requisition, a purchase order, GR, and everything, needs to be supported by a smart technology. And uh, gone are those days where CFOs used to say that, okay, IT is not part of our domain. Uh, the IT function would report to into CEO. Today, most of us uh, have the IT function reporting into us because uh, 
there are so many not only the accounting software but uh, so many other ancillary softwares which require some or the other in inputs from the CFO's uh, area of uh, entire operations and uh, uh, monitoring. So I think uh, none of us in today's world can survive without uh, a smart technology. Okay, uh, so I would like to just add to what my both co-panelists have said. Uh, in fact, uh, I echo what they said. Uh, it is one of the biggest priority of a CFO in today's time. So gone are the days when we were supposed to be only the stewards, controllers, or supposed to act, uh, report numbers with accuracy. Today we are supposed to or expected uh, by the business to be more uh, active contributor, business partner, or a strategist. And uh, you know, smart technologies helps a lot uh, in taking the CFO's journey or the finance function journey in that direction, uh, you know, to a long way. Okay. That's a nice uh, startup by each of the CFOs. Uh, Mr. Nandi, if you go specific here and talk about uh, the, spe uh, the, the uh, particular uh, smart technologies that have enabled finance function for Thomas Cook per se, uh, what you will say? Okay, uh, so I'll just pick up maybe two instances, you know, uh, and um, talk about that. This is something that we have done, and we have done in the last, I would say, three years, so it's fairly recent as well. Uh, and maybe maybe relevant for all of us. Um, so one is that uh, um, we did, uh, you know, we dabbled with RPA, Robotics Process Automation, and uh, in our shared service center. So we have a, a shared service center running out of India, which works for all the group companies, and uh, based out of Bombay, actually. Uh, and among the many things that they do, there is a, a significant amount of time and effort is spent is to be spent on reconciliations. And these are reconciliations, not only the standard bank reconciliations, but also reconciliations across uh, multiple, multiple systems. In a, tra in a travel business, typically, um, you have different systems for the front end and the back end. Okay, there is not an integrated ERP. Like for example, we have SAP running at the back end. Okay, the entire company runs on SAP as far as accounting is concerned. However, at the front end, we have different verticals, and uh, there is no one system or one ERP that suits all of them. So each of them have their own front end system, all of which talk to, talk to SAP. So there's no issue on that. But there are reconciliations required for, you know, for various things. Now, uh, one of the things that we did uh, in the last couple of years is that we went into, uh, we introduced bots for reconciliation. And obviously, we worked with the technology provider. Uh, we didn't have the in-house skill for that. And we are still learning. But uh, as of now, we employ about 15 bots across, uh, doing various types of reconciliations. And uh, let me give an example of how it benefited us. So uh, by, by moving on to bots, I think that about 70% of the, about, we started off with about 50% of the reconciliation being done spot on. This ratio has now moved to about 75% over a period of time because the bots also learn. As you know, the bots are programmed to learn more and more. So it's sort of experiential learning for them. And uh, our idea is that uh, we should move this to about 90%. There will always be some manual element because there will be, it works on unique fields, etc. So if some data is missing for some reason, it will, it will still require some manual intervention. But we think that in about a year's time, we should be able to move up the 75% to about 90 or 95%. That's the aim. This, of course, what does it do to us? What, it, what does it do for us? What it does is that two things. One is reduces the time taken for reconciliation so very, very substantially. Therefore, the number of open items are much less, and all of us understand the implication of that. The second is the... Uh, it reduces the need for manpower very substantially. So it's not that uh, you know, we had to we'd cut people in a very significant way, but what happened is that we could redeploy people, and we know that today um, we can take on more and more work and uh, without you know, increasing our manpower at all. So it's a, obviously we incurred some initial set of costs for bots, and there are some maintenance costs annually, but if you look at a, um, you know, the three-year picture, uh, which is the journey that you have done so far, it's a, you know, in terms of a cost benefit, it's a very significant benefit for us. The other thing that we did was uh, uh, of consequence in the last couple of years is that we um, moved our consultation to automated process. 
so in the group, uh, Thomas Cook, we talked about, uh, Manu talked about 20, you know, 29 countries, etc. So we have about 62 legal entities which we need to consolidate. And uh, obviously, we listed companies, so we need to do that on a quarterly basis. Um, uh, uh, and that's honestly, that's a, that's a very, very uh, intense exercise. Um, and painful exercise, not only intense, but a very painful exercise for the people who actually do it. So um, we moved on to a consolidation software. It took some time to get everybody aligned to that. But today, uh, you know, virtually the entire thing uh, the entire accounts, the financial financials uh, for, the, for the quarter or for the year end, come out of this system, and uh, it's a fairly, you know, obviously there are some queries that need to be raised, some clarifications, some corrections will have to be done, but we have been able to significantly reduce the time that it used to take us for consolidation. So I think these are two examples that I can give you, and where we have been able to improve two things. One is obviously the quality. Uh, the quality of the work that we do, and uh, secondly, the time taken for the work. So, okay. uh, before I uh, take Nidhi's perspective, uh, uh, Devishish, you mentioned the, the cost that you saved, or mm -hmm. initial also, you know, investments that you made on the RPAs in the second instance that you shared. Possible to quantify in your sense uh, in terms of the investments made on on that initially, and then now you are uh, getting returns, uh, like so to say, reaping fruits. So uh, when you say time has got reduced in terms of reconciliation, how much of a time uh, has gone down? See, our reconciliation typically look at the the way we look at it is that how many items are you know what percentage of items are uh, um, you know open, right? So uh, as I said, uh, if I'm able to resolve about 70, 75 percent items immediately, you know, on the first run, so to say, the automated run. Uh, uh, that significantly saves time. So in terms of estimate, uh, today for example, um, or rather, let's rephrase that. So before we implemented this, before we implemented the RPA and got the bots into operation, um, a bank reconciliation, let's take the simple uh, bank reconciliation. A bank reconciliation, there would be, uh, uh, by the time we cleaned up the complete bank reconciliation, it would take probably take a, you know something like 30 to 45 days because there will be open items. Uh, we are a very transaction-oriented company. For example, each ticket or uh, each uh, dollar that you buy from us is a transaction in our books, is a transaction in the bank. And uh, so the number of we are transaction-heavy company. Today, you know, uh, we, the entire exercise probably takes about probably 15 days' time. So it's a very substantial reduction. And we're hoping to do more on that. I think it is... Uh, you know, if I take an example from the consolidation, you know, I think uh, that's easier to, even more easier to understand. Uh, because in consolidation, typically we used to take, um, if from the end of the quarter, we uh, obviously 45 days is the timeline for doing the board meeting for a listed company. And uh, we would struggle till probably the 42nd day to put a consolidation in place, 42nd or 43rd day to put a consolidation in place. Today, uh, we have been able to shave off at least about seven to ten days from that. So that's fairly substantial. It's a significant, yeah. it's a significant number. Yeah. So from 45 days... Uh, let's say, for, yeah, so say 42 days to, let's say, 32 or 35 days, some 30 to 35 days. So, so about, yeah, that's, seven, that's, ten that's days. Twenty percent, about twenty percent reduction. Yeah. That's good to hear. Uh, likewise, you know, maybe if you can also go deep in respect of the technologies you specifically use for your company, uh, which is in textile space, and uh, the, the proof specifically that it read out for you? So, <clears throat> generally, uh, textile um, organization has a lot of volume in terms of weight and quantity of the products, uh, whereas the value would be lower. Uh, now, what tends to happen, it, because of this, it is very labor intensive. Now, what we at Sanathan had done is uh, we've automated our entire packaging as well as storage and retrieval process. Now, as a result of this, so what we have done, we've installed a few robots, which will, uh, basis the program, pack our yarns into the relevant uh, packing cartons or uh, even the pallets, and then it will get stored in our uh, warehouse location. Now, after that is done, whenever there is a dispatch happening, uh, 
the robots automatically pick up the relevant material which needs to be dis uh, dispatched because the entire ASRS system is talking to the SAP. Now, uh, as a result of this, our entire packaging dispatch program is fully automated. Now, apart from that, to add a few things which Debishish mentioned, even we are working on this entire end-to-end -end automation with respect to APIs, wherein various reconciliations are completed at a very faster pace. And uh, as he mentioned, open items are less. At the same time, uh, earlier Sanatan Textiles was a private limited organization. And uh, last year we received the SEBI approval so for the listing. So obviously we converted ourselves from private to public uh, limited. Now, as soon as you enter that space, Compliance is a big animal on the head to monitor, manage so many compliances and believe me, manufacturing organization has more number of compliances um, relatively because you have the Factories Act, the Labor and so on. Now to manage these compliances, we implemented a compliance tool tracking mechanism system uh, which has benefited us in terms of uh, saving of time. Uh, it's doing auto escalations, uh, auto highlighting if, if somebody is missed out on some uh, compliance to be completed. And that's how a management report is getting generated, which can be also placed to the board of directors because you know these independent directors, they, they, they have a special love and care and affection for compliance. The majority of the question on the boardroom are on two fronts. How's the business doing? Are you complying? So, by, to answer these questions, uh, at least this compliance tool is helping me in a big way. So I think these are the few. Apart from this, in my earlier organizations, I've al always automated the hedging process. Because, um, you know, at times in, uh, various service sector, your hedging is a step up progression and uh, if you run on Excel sheets with bigger numbers or uh, numbers which are running in few millions of dollars, you're bound to make some errors. So I've ha ha automated uh, the hedging process uh, even in a service industry as well as a manufacturing organization which uh, was dealing in precious metal. So again precious metal is quite expensive and uh, to ensure that you don't lose out uh, because of hedging. Uh, it's very important that we had to automate that, which we had done. Okay, uh, maybe any quantifiable parameters in terms of the investments as well as the fruits? I mean, See, as I mentioned, for the ASRS, the fruits is that, yes, we do save on labor cost. And uh, also timeliness. Because the robot will get, pull out the carton or the pallet in a fraction of seconds. How much labor cost would you have saved on uh, using this labor cost? Save cost? So, I'm saying for me, it's not saving cost. I don't mean saving employee cost. What I mean is, saving time itself is saving cost. Correct. And time is humongous. I'm saying if a labor had to go and pull out a... So, there are two things here. One is the labor cost of pulling out a carton. Second thing is the space. Because then you need acres of land. Here it's because it is stacked and racked, you can place a lot of finished goods in a very limited space. And I think when we are saving on space, we are saving a lot of amount of capital. Where skies are the limit because as the organization expands, Mm. You'll require more space to uh, store your uh, finished goods as well as raw materials. So even if you take finished goods into uh, consideration, I think by saving lot of space, we have saved that. That's uh, heartening to hear a story like this and I'm sure this would be encouraging for many finance professionals. Uh, Ritesh, what is uh, your view in respect of the smart, technology, smart technologies that uh, Yokohama has used? And uh, uh, how have you gone about that? So, uh, Manu, uh, we are a company where we grew two and a half times in the last three years. 
and uh, you know three years back when we took over this company as a management the biggest question in front of us was what would be our biggest usp or growth driver and one thing which came up was that you know we are in an industry where a consumer only comes once in four years we are into tire industry very boring industry so most of the times the buying decision is done uh, you know where dealer influences the purchase pattern or the choices of the uh, consumer or a customer so we said let's use this as a as a tool to build this competitive advantage and you know get the trust of our dealers so that they are more tuned to sell our pr products now how we use technology coming back to your topic uh, so we had a biggest problem uh, where the claims when a tire goes into a warranty claim used to take as good as 30 to 35 days and a consumer whose tire has gone uh, has gone bust would like to get it replaced in a day or two he would not like to wait for you know uh, 30 35 days especially when you are a premium brand so uh, we use this technology which is uh, image recognition and uh, the biggest challenge which we were, we were earlier facing was that the inspection of the tires or the claim tires was being done by people there was manual uh, you know, movement of tires happening from the consumer to dealer, dealer to our warehouse, then uh, people checking it. We said, uh, no problem. The dealer go ads, he takes the pictures from the mobile. The image reading character, you know, identifies the depth of the tire which is left out and hence decides what is the worn out percentage and accordingly it automatically throws away the, uh, the claim amount which has to be given. So now imagine a cons consumer who was earlier walking in and uh, getting a claim in 30, 35 days, today in three or four days, it gets closed. So that's the kind of uh, thing we did. And another thing which we did, uh, again on the same dealer or the customer front was, uh, you know, using chatbots and WhatsApp automation. More to say, you know, uh, simple thing where we automated the frequently asked questions which a, a, a dealer asks or a, a customer asks in terms of, uh, what is the payment, what is the credit note status, you know, so on and so forth. And what is my limit, so on and so forth. So, you know, these basic technologies where RPA with WhatsApp automation or chatbots helped a lot in, in that sense. Okay, uh, so I think all the uh, benefits uh, uh, narrated by, uh, the benefit stories narrated by the CFOs of the smart technologies are quite encouraging and inspiring, uh, sharing their own experiences. But before I, we jump to the other uh, part, which is the challenges bit of uh, the smart technologies, uh, I want to just get a sense from, from, from the audience here that how many of you have a, uh, uh, do you feel a challenge in, in implementing uh, smart technologies and especially measuring uh, the returns out of uh, smart technologies? Can you raise your hands? If, I mean, if whosoever faces challenge. Okay, so it seems the audience is quite professional when it comes to smart technology. They don't have any challenges whatsoever. That's, <laughs> that's quite an encouraging response from the other side as well. So, uh, Mr. Sebejish, uh, 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 I, I want to come to you on the challenges bit here. Uh, Thomas Koga, of course, uh, as you, you narrated both experiences. But could you just also, uh, these are the success stories that you laid out. But can you also uh, share the uh, mistakes or the so-called not success stories for our uh, very enriching audience to get better understanding? Yeah, I mean, for every success, there are you know probably the equal number of failures. Okay, um, so um, mm, let's pick up. The, so even the let's talk about this journey on the on the. Uh, on the RPA or the bots that we employed for reconciliation because uh, it was not overnight success. Yes, nothing is, and this was certainly not overnight success. Um, when we initially, when we employed the bots, um, so the, you know, it did not, it, th it threw up, the, it threw a lot of errors. Uh, there, there are a lot of reconciliation errors in the first couple of months. In fact, the first month or month, month and a half, I think, um, you know, uh, the team felt, the team members felt that it said to manual process so you know why why do this you know why are you insisting that we do this because this is causing more, more and more pain uh, so you have to sort of reason it out to the team make them understand that you know it is not only humans who learn 
it is a, the bots also learn. There's a learning process for everybody. And uh, technology is an evolving process, and it needs to give it time. So um, similarly, let's talk about the other example that I gave you, um, which is on the consolidation. So um, consolidation, you know, we, um, we tried a different route, different route to consolidation. Um, we, you know, the, our parent company, the parent company that we have is a company based out of Canada called Fairfax. Um, you may not know the name Fairfax, but all of, most of you would know the name Prem Watsa. Prem Watsa runs Fairfax. So um, Fairfax used a particular uh, consolidation tool, which is a standard tool like a Hyperion called OneStream. And we thought that, and we obviously had it. We are, uh, the Fairfax was consolidated in that. But obviously, the, you know, as accountants, you'll understand the consolidation formats, et cetera, that is used for Canada is very, very different from what we have to use in India. The requirements are very vastly different. And uh, so we initially thought that why invest on a separate consolidation tool? Why don't we just use the same, modify to our Indian standards to fit into Indias and stuff like that? Would, would not, that would be useful. So we tried that, honestly we tried that for almost a year, okay, with the help of consultants, etc. And at some point of time we realized that this is not the right way because, you know, it's, you know, you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole to make it simple. Um, uh, our accounting years were different. Uh, it was, you know, one was Jan, December, one was April, March. Uh, the accounting standards, one was, uh, one was following IFRS, one was following Indies. Um, so there are multiple differences, okay? And there's no point trying to force fit something. It would only causing stress. And, uh, you know, we realized that the cost of, it was possible to do it still. You could have you know, two different view of the cube. So to say one on a uh, Jan-December basis, one on a financial basis, but that would also probably cost a lot more and it's likely to be more error prone. So we dis at some point of time we decided that no, this is, while automation is important, we need to find a different tool. So we have, uh, we then decided that, you know, this, the fiscal or the financial year consolidation should be based on a very different tool. Which will, which will consolidate as per Indian accounting standards because we are headquartered in India. Uh, there are many examples, actually, of uh, you know, struggling with technology um, and then finding the right formula. There is no right formula, but there is always a way to, way to succeed. I think where it is important is to have that, uh, what is important here is to have a long-term view. You need to understand that, you know, that what do you want to do in the long term? And long term is not a quarter on quarter view. It's a you know, three, five, seven year sort of view. Uh, anything beyond that, and the team will say, the team here will say that you're very, very old fashioned. You know, anything beyond three years, I'm told is, you know, it, it does not exist. So, um, so you have a long term view. You need to understand the capabilities of your team. You may need to reskill your team or have people with the right skill set. If you want to implement technology solutions, you also need to have people who'd be able to adapt to that technology. For that, either you need to reskill your people, or you maybe you know, hire people with the right set of skills who can then contribute to the project. I think, and um, obviously you need to have faith in once you've decided to do something, you need to have faith in that, and uh, you know, move on in, instead of getting upset by um, you know, uh, small failures on the way. Uh, nice comprehensive perspective, but before I come to Unity, uh, I just want to pick up the very specific point that you uh, touched upon, which is uh, uh, how long is long term, so people may understand uh, it differently. So I want to ask the audience if at all, you know, the uh, very uh, erudite and uh, knowledgeable audience, uh, do you think that beyond three years, uh, you know, things, I mean, you know, it, 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 it's not long term, things don't exist. How many of you think that will be? Okay, so one beautiful hand from the Sula CFO is I could witness. And not many hands. There are, of course, uh, I think, Bittu is encouraging other CFOs to open up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, perspective. Uh, so Bittu certainly does not think that anything beyond three years uh, does not last that way. Uh, uh, but, Coming to you know, uh, coming to the point that we were discussing, and that is the challenges uh, uh, being faced by the CFOs in reaching out the successes, so to say. 
if you can share your journey, you mentioned about labor cost savings uh, and then that translate, translating into uh, saving on capital as well. So if you could narrate your uh, struggles and pains, so to say. So it is rightly said, failures are the pillars to success. And I think in any automation or digitization project, there is a lot of um, ups and downs which come till you go live. Now if I, ups are okay, it's, it's a good moment. But when I talk about the downs, so first is resistance to change. We all know it's very difficult to change from the normal routine which all of us have been following for years together. I mean, just imagine a situation. Let's, let's uh, take a situation, assuming we are, we are all in the same office and one fine day um, a CFO or a few group of people say, this is not working well, let's change, let's automate. Imagine the number of questions or thoughts running around the minds of people. So, some will feel, okay, I cannot adapt to the technology, so maybe I'll be asked to go. Some will have that sense that, what will happen? Isse kya hoga? Fayda nahi hoga, kaam double hoga. So, you will have mixed opinions coming in. But what is important at that point of time is instead of getting carried away with those opinions, be firm that yes, we can work out and drive the change. See, because it's not just on day one you have to drive the change. It's throughout the journey till you go live and after going live till you settle in the new system. Because as he mentioned, people will come and say, is se acha purana cheez acha tha. Manual thing was okay, but is it really okay in today's time? <coughs> the answer is clearly no. So first is resistance to change. Second is, uh, generally I've noticed that from my experience because I've worked with service sector as well as manufacturing setups. Service sector is more technologically advanced and manufacturing sector is in the transition. So they are now, now looking to uh, develop themselves or, you know, elevate themselves to a more technological background. So, especially in the manufacturing setup, when you take this proposal of, okay, let's automate, let's digitize this, that. While, while we are new age CFOs, we look at business compliances and not only cost, but the first questioning or the first Convincing point is the cost, cost-benefit analysis. That also tends to play an important role, especially in manufacturing organizations. Third thing is, you know, when you're actually implementing the project, it so happens that in the excitement of doing the project, from your implementation partners, from your supporters, you start expecting too much. It is like, say, uh, we've designed that we want A, B, C and suddenly in the middle of the project you find, okay, we want Z also, we want Y also. Now that's actually deviating from the project. So it's very important to be focused on the project and this deviation does tend to happen and it starts, it starts right from the junior staff, goes up the pyramid and then you have to take certain decisions, certain calls that let's do this in phase one, what is completely important and then the lesser important things or you prioritize the stuff and move ahead. I think according to me these were the three major challenges, one was resistance to change, the cost factor and priority on the project to remain focused. Because see, it's a time, it's very stressful. It's a time where all teams are working. Uh, there are times where when you automate these processes, uh, one team is dependent on other team's output, which is where 
a lot of coordination and teamwork is also required and if you deviate on your focus that tends to break we don't want that to break so continuously monitoring mentoring and being focused is what i believe okay uh, uh well three important challenges uh, you mentioned and before i go to ritesh for his view let me quickly ask a question to the audience uh, how many of you feel a change to resistance uh, i mean you being uh, you know senior professionals uh, a change to resistance is the biggest challenge you know like uh, resistance resistance to change sorry is the biggest challenge well audience certainly seems to be opening up more uh i think uh, the first three ones are very rightly mentioned uh, they were those are the key top challenges which one a cfo faces when smart technology proposal or even a implementation phase is there one more thing which i think uh, of late has become more relevant is having the right implementation partner so we see lot of small companies startups lot of uh, you know lot of companies coming up approaching us you know giving the proposal the sales guys meet us they give us very fancy proposal they commit a lot but you know when it comes to the real implementation you know it's very important that we get a right partner who who not only sees sees it as a only a business but more sees it that you know he is he is a true partner and he is implementing and helping us guiding us through his experience through his you know knowledgeable team in that expertise field uh not only during the implementation phase but also during our you know post implementation maintenance and upgradation so many times i think this is one challenge which we actually, at least we have faced in last one or two years okay uh mr nelly uh, just for the concluding remarks if i we discuss the benefits the other side risk or the challenges we also discuss any specific things especially uh, for the uh, young professionals that you want to share out of your learnings uh, in 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 in, in respect of how they should go about uh, implementing smart technologies so uh so actually envy the young professionals because they live in the uh, the smart technology age um you know uh, because they are able they will be working on smart technology much more than i will ever work on so that way <coughs> it is it's a uh, it's uh, their journey is a is a very long journey in terms of what what they should one should focus on you know uh, one is to i think focus on um, as a as a finance professional is to see where all uh, not sort of restrict oneself and try to see where all technology can help us okay and that could be i have given two examples out of you know accounts for example there are many examples i could have talked about other examples also um, um, you know there are examples all over there are there are there are taxation related matters that you can you can automate you can bring in smart technology for your tax team you can bring in smart technology for your treasury team um, in fact each and every area that one can look at and all of it uh, will make your work uh, less uh, time consuming it will improve the efficiency and it will ultimately although there will be implementation implementation cost initially in the ultimate analysis it will drive down cost so if you take a sort of you know a 3 to sort of 5 year horizon um, the, it will then see the total cost of operations um, you will see that the cost being driven down so i think the starting point is to um, remove any fixed ideas that you have in your mind look at every possible area where you know smart technology or automation can help and then see which ones are implementable some will be implementable in the short run and some will be in the in the little long, longer run make a list of that proceed with that uh, obviously you need to have a budget for that because none, you know nothing works without a budget in the in the end so you need to but in, over a period of time definitely one can um, you know cut down cost and get higher efficiency okay uh, nidhi one quick uh, you know uh, remark you know if you were to just quickly uh, tell us uh, the advice for perhaps a younger finance professional for you are already you know so young uh, in your career uh, so if you could just quickly in a line quickly tell us look at unexplored areas so today well, most of us are using technology for um, audit to cash purchase to pay gst reconciliations compliance management but look at uh, or treasury management also but uh, look at unexplored areas like 
FP and A and budgeting. So um, quite a few organizations have started uh, taking that task up wherein they run the entire budgeting, forecasting and the variance analysis on it through an automated platform. But uh, I still believe we all need to work towards that uh, in terms of you know, fine-tuning it more better, uh, ensuring it suits our business requirements, and the business requirements change from organization to organization. Apart from that, there are certain areas uh, on the compliance side which has started gaining momentum, and uh, one of them being ESG. Now, today ESG is a good topic, but tomorrow, when it's fully momented, how do you track that, how would you want to, there, there could be some innovation. So today, maybe oh, we might not have a complete answer, but we should start looking at those areas as well. You have answered it very shortly, I must say that. But Ritesh, if uh, you can comply with, with 30 seconds or one minute timeline to answer, you know, your concluding remarks. So, uh, you know, uh, in conclusion, I would say, uh, smart technology is a must uh, in today's environment, especially in a today's time when it's highly uncertain and technology-driven uh, business environment. Having said that, uh, you know, be prepared as a CFOs or business leaders or finance leaders that when you are driving a change and a technology implementation, there would be challenges coming up uh, your way. Uh, it is not going to be a smooth cakewalk, but once you start building a comprehensive strategy and plan to overcome those challenges, uh, I think uh, this is the right direction to go in uh, okay. as we enter the future. Okay, you complied with the timeline. I'm so happy with that. That leaves us three minutes uh, precise for the very not knowledgeable and erudite uh, audience. Uh, any questions uh, from uh, from the audience? A patient, extraordinary, patient hearing audience. So Bitu has a question. I'm so glad that Sula CFO has a question. For the eminent panelists. Yeah, uh, my question is to Nidhi, and uh, you know, uh, we've talked about failures that you know you can do projects that can be failures, that can be successes. But uh, in today's day and age, you know, frugality is also required when it comes to that. And we also know that we are a country of around 1.4 billion population, so so there is ample number of people available to do a certain task. Hence, cost benefit is very essential. You know, starting a project. Uh, looking at it from an end-to-end -end point of view uh, or rather, you know, putting a proper structure in place. So what are your views on that? You know, how do you start off a project? How do you say that, okay, this is the implementation that I want to do? So again, as I mentioned, because the requirements will differ from organization to organization, first is what is suiting the organi relevant organization. Now, once you all f start with what is your pain area. First is what is your pain area, what you're trying to solve for. After that, once you know what you're trying to solve for, how it will get solved, here comes a role where you have, you need to have a lot of discussion with uh, various uh, people in the market in terms of whom you want to be implementation partners, do you have the right fit of people in your team? Uh, see, there are two ways. You either mentor your team or you get the right set of people. So will that team or will that right set of people be able to, uh, you know, take your implementation through and take it to the go line? Apart from that, if you see very recently, there's a lot of attrition happening in the technology space. Uh, I don't mean layoffs. Uh, that's that's aside, but lot of attrition and a uh, lot of people are just churning jobs. Now, when this is happening, if if something like this happens in your implementation partners end, uh, don't want to be in a situation that that the organization who's implementing gets into a fix. So that contract with the implementation partner, that support which you are expecting the wavelength with the implementation partner, I believe is very important. Now, given that all this is done and you are looking to kick off the project, support from your team members, your uh, management, 
is also very important and uh, that's the reason why i believe when when initially only you are discussing your pain points or your solution requirements get the relevant people involved in the project right from day one so that there is no uh, sort of handover takeover process i think i'm running out of time <laughs> i hope i have answered your question yeah, thank you i think a uh, couple of questions if you can quickly take though i have no you know i've been uh, no, now i have become non compliant <laughs> <laughs> i hope that regulator does not uh, take any action against me but yeah, yeah. please please go ahead gentlemen hi uh, my name is adil uh, I am also a uh, small software vendor. So I can see that uh, uh, the challenges come basically in selecting the software vendor. So why doesn't the client uh, company takes a guarantee from the software vendor that if uh, they are not able to provide the services satisfactorily, then the, it's a, uh, why don't they take a guarantee? Yeah. So uh, money back guarantee or something like that. So that can be a uh, uh, guarantee that the project can be successful whoever vendors uh, give that solution then that vendor should be selected something like that Sorry. Uh, so uh, you're right uh, not exactly uh, in the strict sense the way you defined but yes accountability needs to be fixed and to fix that uh, we've recently moved to a scenario where uh, with the implementation partner we have a legal agreement which says which defines the parameters and the timeline within which they are supposed to deliver those parameters. Uh, and there are certain percentage of the entire, uh, you know, uh, sum which is supposed to be paid to the implementation partner is linked to that. Having said that, we have to also be cognizant of the fact that a lot of it is also, you know, many times it's all, it could also be that, you know, the reason why we couldn't achieve the desired results is uh, there are you know, issues at our end in terms of uh, adoption, delays in change in business process, etc. So one has to be fair. While you can put that in the agreement, at the end of the day, you have to be fair to both the guys, both the parties. Okay. So I just want to add to what Ritesh is saying, and his points are very valid. Just want to add to the fact that you can get your money back from the software vendor in some form or the other, but you can't get the time back. You spent a six months or a year on a project, and then it is not going anywhere. Those days will not come back. So uh, I think that's that's also very important. Okay. Uh, any further question? Was you the one? Yeah. Actually, I have a comment uh, than a question. So uh, I mean, uh, we recognize that uh, people are a big part of any change man management, be it IT or non-IT initiatives. But we, uh, you know, we continue to ignore the fact that we need an ECM partner. You know, enterprise. Uh, change management partner, you know. I haven't seen this practice. I myself come from a management consulting practice and we don't offer that service. I'm not trying to sell anything. But this is something that we continuously recognize uh, but we still choose to ignore. Is there any change in the trend that you uh, you see from other side of the table that uh, you take uh, uh, the services of a change management uh, uh, providers? Is that something uh, starting to happen in our space? Maybe I can try and uh, say something on this and leave, uh, leave it to the other panelists, my co-panelists. Uh, you're quite right. You know, this is something which is very often ignored. Probably stems from the belief that we will be able to, the in-house team would good en is good enough to manage that, obviously with the help of the tech provider. So overconfidence is another name for it. Um, we have, I, I remember one project where it did uh, use a, change management partner, as you, as you mentioned, and it was quite successful. So probably um, this is coming in, it will, but not to the extent that uh, uh, it's not so widespread as yet, but over a period, and it's normally it is considered for projects which are, um, which are large scale projects, which um, also involve a lot of value in terms of, in terms of money, in terms of, uh, either as either a savings that can be generated or a revenue that can be generated. So, um, say for example, if you are working on a um, one example that I can talk about where we use that we did a, um, a ZBB ZBO project, a zero-based budget income, zero-based organization project, where uh, we worked. You know, while we did all that that was required, we worked with the change management partner who helped us travel through that period. Uh, but this was a long project. This was, you know, went up, I think, anything between about 12 to 15 months sort of project. 
and then we realized that we need somebody to guide us through. Also because of the fact that we had not done that before, so we didn't have the experience within the organization. And it finally it worked very well for us. So yes, the short answer is that yes, it is something that, um, that's required. Um, but we don't see that as yet, but I think there will be a growing trend. Okay, I think that's where we should uh, leave. Uh, but before leaving, I just want to summarize with, with a statement perhaps made by me, uh, uh, Mr. Devashish Nehmi to an answer to, to a question raised, and that is, we cannot, uh, we can get our money back, but we can't get uh, time certainly back. And I hope the session per se uh, was uh, insightful, and we have made the most of uh, this time that we have spent with this uh, August uh, CFO panelists as well as the August. Uh, CFO audience, so to say. Uh, may I request you all, we all, to uh, again uh, have a quick round of applause for, for all of us here. Uh, for extraordinary uh, sincerity, patience, focus, and uh, knowledge that you guys have possessed. Thank you so much.